evening, to bring ourselves up to date, we want to remind you that this is a discussion of the, or a continuation of the talk that we gave last week. At this point, however, we want to introduce a certain fragment from the alchemical and hermetic concept of Paracelsus. At his time, and for a long time before, there was no distinction between chemistry and alchemy. The two branches of research were undivided, and as far as Paracelsus was concerned, alchemy was true chemistry, and chemistry was only a part of the larger tradition. As we noted before, he used such terms as anatomy to cover not only the body structure, but the structure of the total person, so that psychology, religion, philosophy should all be included in the study of anatomy. In the same way, in the study of chemistry, not only the bodies of the elements and their compounds, but the spiritual potential and all of the mystical and magical properties of substances should properly be included within the field of chemistry. The word alchemy, of course, has the Arabic prefix el or al, meaning divine. Therefore, alchemy is a divine chemistry or the chemistry of universals. It was derived in part from philosophy and contributed again, and contributed again to philosophy. So no consideration of the work of Paracelsus could be complete without at least a summary of how this subject blended with his other findings and beliefs and contributed to his thinking. Incidentally, Paracelsus was no mean chemist in his own right, and modern authors are inclined to attribute to him the discovery of two elements, nitrogen and hydrogen. They feel that his researches entitle him to recognition. The alchemical and hermetic teachings of this great philosopher uses the same terminology that we find a little later in the 16th and 17th century hermetic school of thought. Primarily, three elements are recognized, salt, sulfur, and mercury. These elements, through their mingling, produce the mysterious stone of the wise. This stone, the Lapis Philosophorum, was a threefold mystery in itself, for it included the powder of projection or transmutation, by means of which a thousand times the weight of the material could by this powder be transformed into pure gold. The second important quest of the alchemist, incorporated in the search for the soul, was the elixir of life, a mysterious substance for the indefinite prolongation of human existence, at least so generally believed. The third goal was the universal medicine, an absolute panacea for the woe of the world. Many chemists labored their lives through with ancient formulas and recipes, attempting to solve the mystery of the soul. Paracelsus declared that the secret was imparted to him in Constantinople, and that a piece of the stone itself, called by him Azoth, was concealed within the handle of his sword, and went around with him wherever he traveled. This stone 
had the power to impart itself to other substances so that it could be infinitely projected and its utility eternally prolonged. That these symbols have more meaning than may first appear is inevitable. We cannot begin to exhaust the fire philosophy tonight because actually it is as complete and involved as any system that we know in the world today. We must immediately forget the quaint notion that these chemists were merely avaricious mortals seeking wealth. This may have been the false goal of some, but the hard core of chemical research was composed of idealists, dreamers, and mystics who recognized in their art, or in their philosophy, a recapitulated science, a science which would enable them to reproduce the workings of the universal mystery of life. They were deeply concerned with these subjects, and uh, Paracelsus was one of their great guides and teachers one who pointed the way to numerous useful and also many mystical experiments. The theory of Paracelsian alchemy relating to the elements begins with the concept that the physical elements as we know them, by their peculiar and particular construction, can never be completely amalgamated. Thus, in their outward natures and forms, the identity of elements can be changed. But actually, the elemental principle itself cannot be altered. It must be altered only from within, although combinations of elements may result in numerous compounds which appear to be different. The problem of compounds is not sufficient. This is merely an application of a principle. But the main end was to discover the method of reducing elements from their growth to their essential parts, from that uh, phase of their existence which is apparent and belongs to the sphere of effect, and that phase which is not apparent and, of, and pertains to the sphere of causes or of essences. Thus, when Paracelsus refers to gold, he does not refer to metallic gold as we know it, but to the spirit of gold, to the mysterious essence of gold after all of its physical attributes have been dissolved. When he speaks of salt, he speaks not of the salt that we know, but of the spirit of salt, that which has been completely purified of its body, and is an invisible and intangible essence. And when he speaks of mercury, he does not refer to the gross chemical or substance or element which we know as mercury. He refers to the spirit, the mysterious volatile agent, which is locked behind the principle of mercury. Thus he gives us a bit of very important philosophy when he says that these substances in their physical combination will form compounds. But the essences of these principles in their transcendental combinations form identities and that they cannot be brought together in the construction of the universal medicine until all of their material attributes and aspects have been completely purified or transmuted. He also points out that all material elements are the result of the outflowing of their magisterium or invisible principle. Therefore, visible gold is an extension of invisible gold. It is a growing downward from an unseen root, a gradual emergence from the unseen to the seen, a procedure from the fine to the gross from the nature of essence to the nature of substance. Therefore, in the transmutation of gold itself, from a substance to an essence, 
the process re re uh, requires the reversal of the process of generation. This reversal in metals, as in morality, is called regeneration. And the regeneration of metals consists of the reabsorption of their lesser natures into their greater, even as regeneration in man does not imply the casting aside of material, but in the purification of them and their gradual restoration to their essential natures. Thus metals, like the human consciousness or the human soul, pass through processes of generation by which they move from the invisible to the visible, and of regeneration in which they return from the visible to the invisible. And this great cycle is called a rotation. And life consists of an infinite variety of rotations with all things in various degrees of generation or regeneration. The result of regeneration is the reduction of all things that are substantial or fixed to a volatile state. And in this volatile state, and in this state alone, they can be truly united. And in uh, substance and fact, as Paracelsus points out, in the volatile state, all things move towards union, whereas in their substantial state, they move toward disunity or to separate, uh, separate existence. He is telling us substantially that the spirits of all things abide together, but by the bodies of things they are separated, and that nothing which is separated by body can be united with another thing until that body itself has been regenerated, redeemed, or transmuted. Thus in alchemy we have the uh, term transmutation, which is the reduction of the gross parts of things, their refinement or their purification, their transforming from a formal to an essential nature. Paracelsus then tells us the secret of the great agent, the mysterious Azoth, by means of which salt, sulfur, and mercury can be bound together and can form the universal medicine which is for the healing of the nations. According to Paracelsus, Azoth, the mysterious stone of the master, is actually sidereal will. Will is the mysterious power by means of which all things can be brought into relationships of unity or disunity, that they can be attracted into a sympathetic situation or repulsed into an antipathetical one. Will, therefore, in the universe, is the power by which all things were created, the fiat, the spoken word, the symbol of the predetermination of deity. For by the will of God, all things are accomplished. By the will of heaven, the earth is maintained. Man's will, situated as a principle within his body, operating through the nervous system, carries his commands to his parts and members, causing them to obey him by an impulse so slight and intangible that man no longer realizes that it is a conscious impulse. What then shall we say direct will? And to Paracelsus, the obvious answer was consciousness. Consciousness directs will. Will becomes the instrument or servant of consciousness. When will moves or causes motion, the result of the motion of will is force. And the exhaustion of the motion of will in the process of force results in matter. Now this is a very interesting formula. And not so very far from our present conclusions, particularly in certain of the higher brackets of physics. In other words, will, uh, motion, and matter are conditions of each other. Therefore, matter 
is susceptible of absorption into force or motion. The only immediate way in which matter can be transformed is for it to be transformed into motion. When the will is able to transform matter into motion, it raises it to the next degree of volatility. This transformation is not the destruction of matter. It is not a separation between will and matter. It is the restoration of matter as force, regeneration or transmutation. Paracelsus points out that nothing can be transmuted into that which is dissimilar to its own essence. Thus gold can be formed in alchemy only because the seed of gold is in all things. Gold cannot be produced artificially where gold is absent. But Paracelsus points out that there is no place where gold is absent. In the same way, by any means or method within the sphere of the hermetic art, these seeds, which are eternal in space, the seeds of substances, elements, metals, principles, these seeds can be caused to grow by art. And according to Paracelsus, alchemy is art perfecting nature. That the alchemist becomes therefore the gardener, the servant, the handmaiden of nature. Assisting nature, performing only such experiments as nature itself has performed, but reversing those processes by means of which nature first placed the elements in the world. And by reversing these processes, rescuing each element from its grosser part and restoring it to its higher or spiritual part. Thus the redemption and resurrection of metal is uh, revealed or shown in such al alchemical texts as the Splendor Solus, where we see the resurrection of the metal symbolized by the resurrection of Christ because it represents the resurrection of principles the restoration of the identity between matter and force. Paracelsus also tells us then that in all material things, matter is not to be regarded as a substance separate and apart. It is the least degree of a substance superior to itself. And the only way in which matter can escape its own materiality is by reabsorption into that which is superior to itself. He then gives us a theological parallel, namely that body can never be cast aside. But what we call death is in way, no way is an actual separation of man from the material principle. But the material principle cannot be discarded because the material principle is only the negative pole of the soul itself. Therefore, the restoration of the soul, in this case, the restoration of essence, must be attained by art. This art being the skill to cause the reabsorption of body into soul, its regeneration or transmutation, into that which may appear different from its present state, but which is even more similar to its essence, or the transmutation could not be accomplished. In the alchemical tradition, therefore, sulfur represents the spiritual or will factor. The essence or spirit of sulfur is therefore the essence or spirit of will. Salt represents the so-called material factor. It represents, therefore, matter, that which is furthest removed from activity, that which forms a calyx or matrix into which essences and elements are poured, but which is itself associated to, with and bound to all conditions superior to itself. Matter is, therefore, not something which is antipathetical to life. It is that in which the element of life, the principle of life, is not immediately obvious, and from which this principle cannot be extracted except by art, or the processes, the conscious processes of the redemptive sciences. Mercury combines both of these polarities. 
Mercury therefore represents both force and motion. Motion is a mean, and motion is of two kinds. Motion is a thing moving from one place to another, or a condition advancing or retiring from its existing state. Thus we may say that motion is quantitatively or qualitatively defined. An individual who goes from Los Angeles to San Diego proceeds as a result of a kind of motion. An individual who ascends from stupidity to wisdom is also moving, but it is a different kind of motion. These various types of motion have given rise to speculations relating to the fourth dimension. But qualitative motion is that which is identified with redemption, regeneration, or transmutation. Qualitative motion is therefore a qualitative return to a superior condition by an evolutionary means, or a qualitative descent to an inferior condition by an involutionary procedure. Mercury is the controller of motion. Mercury represents, therefore, the binder. In man, Mercury is the human soul. The human soul, being will, gradually transforms or unfolding into the aspect of force or motion. And as this force or motion, as, as soul, stands between body, which is soul, and consciousness, which is soul. Mercury becomes what is called the universal solvent. And this solvent, as Paracelsus describes, as the twofold nature of the psychic self. This twofold nature being composed of the intellectual and emotional propensities. The, inter the intellectual uh, faculties uh, create solution. And that by solution we now mean bringing into a state of solution as a material substance, not a solving, but brought into a suspension within a liquid or fluid. The intellectual uh, state of solution is the result of a series of processes by which man intellectually discovers the superior natures of things in relation to their appearances. A simple example of this is that man, studying effects, gradually becomes aware of cause. He is unable to see or personally examine cause in most instances, yet he creates a vast abstract universe of causes to sustain and rationalize the effects which he can see. If his rationality is true, if his reason is correct, uh, these causes which he has hypothecated ultimately will be demonstrated to be true. Thus, the mind is constantly binding to the invisible superior to the visible inferior, building bridges of reason across the interval between cause and effect. The emotional side of man's psychic nature accomplishes not by reason, but by emotion or by love. Therefore, love is an emotional bridge. It is a psychic quality of affinity. And affinity is another term for bringing together of things. Therefore, through faith, through sublimity, through imagination, man creates bridges between qualities and conceives of the possibility love or affection of achieving transformation or transmutation. The psychic life as Mercury carries within it the power of the king which is sulfur and it also extends downward into matter as force. Therefore Mercury is a binder, a solver, which accepts into itself many things finding in these acceptances the basis of a new hermetic union, or a hermetic marriage, as it was called by the alchemists. 
the absorption of the body into the soul, therefore results also in the creation or generation of the homunculus. The homunculus being the crystalline correspondent to the body, the transparent being, the child made of glass and fashioned within glass, the glass in this case being the alchemical retort. The alchemical retort always represents the human magnetic field within which these transformations take place. Regeneration, therefore, is an experiment performed within the bottle of the human astral body, which the Paracelsus is not the same as the emotional body of modern mysticism, but is a complete psychic envelope containing within it all those parts of man which are associated with material or objective individuality. Here we have then sulfur as the pure symbol of the spiritual will, the gold. We have also mercury, that which is forever seeking to overcome intervals. Mercury overcomes intervals intellectually, where it overcomes prejudice, where it overcomes ignorance, superstition, or these artificial dividing factors by which human relationships are mutilated. Mercury overcomes intervals in the sign of faith, belief, love, service, and all these emotional uh, strengths by means of which man comes to an apperceptive sense of identity with life and with other living things. Thus Mercury is called the sun, in this case spelled S-O-N. It is the offspring. It is the product of the union of will and matter. It is the soul, which is the product of the union of spirit and body. Now, the alchemical symbolism also sometimes tells us that Mercury is the result of the marriage of the sun and moon. The sun, in this case, is the spirit or sulfur principle. The moon is the earth, material, or salt principle. Mercury, the child of the sun and moon, the progeny of heaven and earth, that which is born of the universe and of nature. Or, as Geta tells us in Faust, is suspended twixt heaven and earth dominion wielding. This mysterious great figure of the Sephar Zohar, the great image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the being with one foot upon the earth and the other upon the sea and its head in the sky. This great symbol of the complete cosmic being is man. Man is the son of heaven and earth, the son of God and nature. He is the one that stands at the ascending apex of form and at the descending apex of spirit. Within himself, the two irreconcilable opposites, otherwise not in nature brought together, salt and sulfur, body and consciousness. In him they are united by the link or bridge of soul. Therefore man is a living soul. And because he has a soul, he is equipped or possesses within himself all of the elements required to the perfection of the soul, which is his own immortality. Through the union of spirit and body, in the neutral field of the soul, all things necessary to man may be achieved. His regeneration, transmutation may be accomplished. And within his own composite nature is the final formula for the projection of the red lion, the mysterious universal medicine. Paracelsus then tells us what this medicine is substantially. He tells us that this medicine is composed of the union of divided parts, 
the things which are otherwise not related, not united, and are in their outward natures and substances dissimilar, and therefore exist in an artificial union susceptible of dissolution. The is opposite to the power of the soul. It can be rescued from their grosser natures and in their essences may be combined, thus being combined by the actual chemistry of the soul itself. Thus, according to Paracelsus, body is not rejected, merely calcinated or destroyed. Body returns or is reabsorbed into soul, as in the Buddhist idea of the dewdrop slipping back into the eternal sea. In the soul, the superior and the inferior are bound together in the indissolvable union of which the philosophers termed the hermetic marriage, and which was the beginning of immortality. This immortality was due to the fact that it was established upon sympathy, that the elements were no longer in conflict with each other, but had been brought into an absolute equilibrium. And in this equilibrium, there was neither stress nor pressure, neither abundance nor depletion, but all things being in absolute equilibrium were indestructible. Now for the transformation of flesh into soul brings with it the secret of eternal life. Paracelsus did not deny, however, that all processes which take place within man may also take place within nature, and that if it is possible in the psychochemical experiments to create immortality for man, it is quite conceivable that in the field of the medicine, the elixir of life can be formulated in the same way, for everything that is true in man is true everywhere else in nature, and anything which is true in nature is true also in man. Paracelsus points out, therefore, that life itself is indestructible, and therefore, by this virtue or this token, Absolute identification with life confers indestructibility. But that life which is separate, divided apart, or has not yet achieved its conscious transmutation, does not participate objectively in this immortality, although the elements composing it are indestructible. Therefore, if indestructible elements are brought together in an indissolvable union, there is immortality, because none of these elements are themselves destructible, but their compounds can be dissolved. If they can be brought into an indissolvable compound, then they do not perish. But this indissolvable compound belongs to a sphere of essence. It is, uh, belongs to a psychic or invisible world rather than to the temporal sphere in which we exist. On this same basis, then, Paracelsus speaks of the medicine of sympathy. The medicine of sympathy, which is this tremendous power of soul over matter. This mysterious matrix from which matter comes and to which it returns again. For all matter must be reabsorbed into the psychic life of things. This is a point that perhaps is of great interest in modern psychology, because Paracelsus was perhaps one of the first to point out that the entire psychological chemistry of living, with all of its experiences, its problems, its difficulties, and its tribulations, that these experiments, are all involved in the process of transferring the central focus of human existence from a physical to a psychological plane. Ultimately, the body and all attributes, which we now call physical, will retire into the psychological, and man will be a psychological being rather than a physical being. And every essential principle contained in body will be re established and reintegrated upon the psychic level. Thus the ultimate or the next major state of man 
will be as a psychic being participating in the nature of Mercury, whereas today he is too close to the salt, which is so symbolically associated with tears. Perhaps this is why the ancients believed, the Egyptians particularly, that the water of tears was a medicine against death. And in their graves and in their monuments, they placed small lacrimals, usually adorned with the head of the deity Hathor. These lacrimals were supposed to contain the tears of the mourners, and they formed the medicine. And the Egyptians believed that tears were the medicines which perfected the soul, a, a point which can be uh, symbolically extended in a very interesting way. Now we're going back with this basic thought of uh, the chemical field of Paracelsian thought to our problem of the sympathies which exist. We are now able to proceed on his medical philosophy with certain new points available to us. One of these points is that sympathies exist only on levels of essential being or of essence. And therefore, the things to be brought together can only be held together in their essence, never in their form. That in medicine, the essence of the medicine is the remedy, not the body thereof. And all essence dealing with sickness, the medicinal property which is contained within the physical medication is not primarily a remedy for the body, but that the remedy operates also in the psychic sensitivity of the essential chemical field, and that it is only by reflex that its um, beneficial effect may be noted in the body. In other words, when you cauterize a wound with a powerful uh, cauterizing agent of some nature, or you sterilize it with a powerful antiseptic, it is not the direct effect of the chemical upon the wound that produces the sterilization. It is the magnetic field of the medication operating upon the magnetic field of the area where the wound is. And by reverse, or by extension, the moment certain antipathetical or negative energies are removed from the invisible background of the wound, it will no longer superate or infect. Essence cannot affect substance primarily. It must affect the essence behind the substance. Also, one substance upon another, outwardly, will produce very slight remedial results because it would be like throwing a rock against another rock. We could not expect anything more than a powerful resistance. To become effective, therefore, a remedy must pass between the interstices of a grosser substance and reach into that which is behind or within. Medications, therefore, consist of forms and essences. But the remedy is not in the form any more than the value of the pill is in the capsule in which it is placed. The physical remedy, then, carries with it an invisible magnetic factor. This magnetic factor may be simple derived from a remedial substance in nature. It may be compound, being formed out of several substances, either natural or in one way or another produced by art. But in any event, the remedy, when it is complete, 
carries within it a vibratory power, a vibratory formula. This vibratory power or formula, striking upon the sensitive vital double of the material structure, is able to unite with it, inasmuch as man has all substances outside of himself within himself. There is a substance outside suitable for the repairing of any damage inside. Not, however, physically alone, but because both share in a common substance essence. They, uh, they share in a kind of energy. Thus the energy of an elm tree, or the energy of a dandelion, or the energy derived from the burned horns of rams, may have a certain use in the human body. Hippocrates used burned ram horns for the treating of asthma. And gradually a very elaborate series of remedies arose, which according to Paracelsus were remembered only by their names or structures, but the real method or means of their efficacy was not understood. This efficacy lay in the compatibility of the vital field. There is something in man that is vibratorily sympathetic to an elm tree, something else that is vibratorily sympathetic to a dandelion root. There is some part of man's nature that responds to these different energies around him. To discover, therefore, the area of a depleted energy and to resupply that energy constitutes true medication. The energy itself, supported, fortified, moves into the physical circumstance and corrects it. The remedy, the salve rubbed on the outside, does not comfort the patient. But the magnetic field of the stars may strengthen by sympathy a depleted energy resource causing pain, uh, causing pain, or it may be antipathetical to a destructive element, the overabundance of which is destroying health. So we come to the next Paracelsian formula, namely that health being the normal state of man. Sickness must be either through privation or the reduction of necessary energy or by excess by which some energy becomes more dominant than the bodily need requires. By privation there is a depletion and therefore a wasting, a fading, a devitalizing an exhaustion. By a superabundance or an excess, there is an intensification, uh, there is an aggravation, there is a swelling or an enlargement. There is some circumstance arise which, indi arise which indicates that some element is present in quantities too great to be useful. And most uh, elements composed in the nature of man are in their proper quantity useful and in their privation or excess dangerous. Now Paracelsus also noted that nature has a tendency uh, to come to certain relief or help of the physician in cases of remedy. Remedies which are natural in themselves and which operate primarily through the instrument of nutrition. In other words, medications that are derived from natural sources and are in themselves neither toxic nor violent. 
If taken into the body in a superabundance in the course of treatment, are usually uh, discharged from the body without danger or difficulty. In other words, a certain cup or container in man's energy field is not full. If it is filled, the need is met. If more material is supplied, the cup simply runneth over. And that which is superlative or superficial is simply eliminated through the system. Thus, in natural remedies, nature protects uh, overabundance preventing the individual from having any serious difficulty from excessive dosage. If, however, the medication is violent, then this may not be true. Paracelsus says that natural remedies persuade the body. Artificial remedies force the body. Where the body is healed by persuasion, the full cooperation of the body is present. Where it is treated by force, then everything is at the discretion of the physician. And if he is unwise or unable to control his agent, he may cause serious damage to the organism. This was an old theory, but it has since uh, gained considerable uh, interest and has also been placed upon a far more scientific footing than it was at that time. Now, recognizing then that man is surrounded by sympathetic sources of energy, the Paracelsian corpus points out that the health of the body of primitive man and of man in his natural state is through nutrition. And nutrition involves both food and respiration. Of course, water is included with food. If, therefore, the normal person is normally nourished and his nourishment is wisely and naturally selected, he is in the best probability of maintaining good health. If, however, through lack of discrimination or discretion, he departs from those substances suitable to the nourishment of his kind, or through ingenuity or other means, disturbs the natural chemistry of nutrition, then he is no longer sustained or supported and must fall back upon his own resources to determine his tolerances and to protect himself against excess and privation. Paracelsus therefore points out that the science of nutrition uh, to the average person is the only way in which the exact method of supporting the body can be communicated or informed. Thus, the individual who wishes to be healthy must gain a certain basic knowledge. And if he does not attain this knowledge, he must depend either upon instinct or upon remedy. The animal kingdom, depending largely upon instinct, is seldom sick as a result of its food. Man, not able to depend directly upon instinct because of the false education of his appetite, is subject to numerous dis uh, indiscretions for which he must compensate by medication or by uh, scientific assistance. Having thus uh, recognized that nutrition is the ideal basis for the concept of the maintenance of body vitality, Paracelsus then makes great point of exercise, sunshine, hygiene, and was for many years experimenting with mineral baths and things of that nature. He was always seeking for natural methods. Methods in which, truly, art became the servant of nature, taking its orders directly from natural methods, natural ways, 
and only resorting to artificial means in extremely artificial situations where nature's natural methods could not be relied upon. In this way, he gradually envisioned what might be termed normal health. Health in this case being the pure and complete circulation of energy through an undefiled organism and that this organism was under the control of a creature, by nature reasonable, by emotion uh, moderate, and by enlightenment illumined in causes, a creature with its spiritual root in religion, its intellectual life in philosophy, and its material existence within science. If such a creature could hypothetically be found in all its glory, we would have the perfect man. He would not, Paracelsus, would not have gone on at all with the assumption of Schopenhauer or Nietzsche that the perfect man was the product of breeding. He says the perfect man is the product of alchemy, the product of hermetic art, inasmuch as perfection must be attained by individual and personal effort. Man is not born perfect. Man is born, however, normal. And by the unfoldment of his natural endowed potential, in a normal and reasonable man way, man can attain gradually to a state of security. It was because of this that Paris also thundered against the policies of his time, the institutions which influenced men, the fallacies of theology, and all these agencies by means of which the natural life of the individual was distorted or disturbed. And therefore, he was more endangered with sickness than should naturally be his lot. Let us think now what was meant by sympathy. We talk of people being in sympathy with each other. They sort of get along. They have instinctive and intuitive recognition of common values. So uh, Paracel in terms of Paracelsus, sympathetic attraction is a kind of psychic gravity by which things of like nature experience the fact that by likeness interval is annihilated. And things sympathetically associated are nearer than in any other relationship. And things which are thus near must be near in qualitative terms. Individuals can live under the same roof for a lifetime and never be near. Others may live on opposite sides of the world and never meet, yet be in a strange psychic concord. Sympathy is therefore always based upon similarity, based upon things in common, where antipathy is based upon things held not in common, or things held at variance. Sympathy, according to Paracelsus, is a magnetic force in which the greater mass attracts the lesser just as in the case of the gravity pull of planets. Therefore, a greater mass of a quality draws lesser parts of the same quality back to itself, or else causes them to move in orbit around its mass as the planets move about the sun. The greatest fountain and source of all sympathy is God, because God represents total identity, and as all things existing in creation exist in common dependence upon deity, and in their own natures contain the substances and essences of deity, all things in their natural state are drawn to deity. And that which interferes with this magnetic sympathy is egoism, or personal will, or 
the barrier set up by bodies. Bodies cannot be identical. Essences can. Bodies heat together to form masses. Essences uniting together are not even visible. Essences united together also neither increase nor decrease the sum of essence, inasmuch as the essence itself is eternal, and whether united or not united is of the same quantity. Thus in nature, the, the sympathetic attraction of things is always like attracting light. This is true spiritually, philosophically, emotionally, psychologically, and materially. This, however, is a two-edged sword. For if like attracts like, this attraction is primarily upon the level of vibration. Things of similar vibration move together, draw upon each other, or are drawn inevitably by the greater mass of the same vibration to identity with it, or to form satellitic motion around it. If, therefore, sympathy thus exercises a continuous push or pull effect, it becomes obvious that the quality of the factors will be of supreme importance. If like attracts like, negation attracts negation, death attracts death. If like attracts like, we must assume that any destructive tendency that we may possess draws destructive energy, and that therefore what we call growth is a thing calling upon energy like itself for the continuous substantiation of its own existence. The terms may be quaint, but I think the meaning is rather obvious. As Cassandra, the muse of doom, uh, observed, the one who sows the whirlwind must reap the whirlwind. Whatever be the quality by which we attract, so we will attract. Whatever be the motivation behind the impulse to attract, so will the thing attracted be motivated. Attraction is by one of two sources or circumstances. One is the unconscious will which is locked within substances themselves. And the other is the conscious will which can be administered by man and which will respond to the insistences of his conscious purposes. In the terms of the energy field, blazes out in a tremendous blast of destructive psychic power. This blast, almost like an atomic blast, does to a certain degree block the normal circulation of good energy. It decreases the power of the constructive polarities in the body, exercising their functions and attracting constructive energy. Therefore, all excess of all kinds is paid for by the depletion within some other field of the organism. The moment balance is lost, health is lost. Only the circumstances are not sufficiently obvious for us to recognize them immediately. In the same way, a person moved by great kindliness, a great affection or regard, sincere esteem and respect, becomes in sympathy with the entire and total field of natural energy. Also, 
with the released, developed, and individualized field of this psychic quality, which man himself has enriched through time. Thus, all kindliness falls upon the kindly availability of life, draws energy of its own quantity and quality, and attracts according to the intensity of the demand, thus causing an enlargement or an enrichment. Paracelsus points out that all energy fields, which are in themselves constructive, are vitalizing, whereas all that are destructive are devitalizing. It may happen that in a moment of great appreciation we energize our love of beauty in the uh, presence of a great object of art or something of that nature. This causes a powerful psychic center to attract aesthetic energy. This aesthetic energy, however, is essentially good. It is essentially beautiful, essentially true. This energy, therefore, may support and will be sympathetic with a variety of other energies in man. We frequently hear an individual say that after reading a beautiful poem or looking at a beautiful picture, he feels better. This is because his entire nature has been invigorated by proximity to highly constructive energy. Remembering always that every mood, every division of temperament, every attitude, Every thought, every emotion, each one of these is a rate of vibration. Thus, such rates of vibration, drawing upon their own kind, strengthen, intensify, and gain new um, means of operating upon the body, thus strengthening or helping to build objective sensory perceptions and appreciation, sensibilities, and sensitivities. Everything being thus vibratory, the sympathetic polarity must be understood and cultivated. Here Paracelsus gives us a a peculiar but vitally interesting moral or spiritual reason for integrity. He clearly indicates that the moment that we depart from integrity, we do so because mentally or emotionally we are energizing negative fields, that we are creating polarities to draw to ourselves destructive forces. And these bombarding us will affect not only the particular emotion which they uh, represent, but by overstimulating that emotion will further unbalance the total organism. Now sympathies not only exist thus between man and creatures around him, they exist between man and the universe, man and God, and the sympathetic relationship between man and God is expressed or manifested through the mystical experience. This is an experience of sympathy. So Paracelsus tells us that no one can experience anything totally dissimilar to himself. That for which we have no sympathy can bestow nothing upon us. That for which we have sympathy must inevitably bestow upon us. Sympathy, by strengthening and vitalizing organizations in the psychic 
and neurophysical field of man. By strengthening these polarities will cause the individual to be aware, to have understanding of, to be able to participate in, to share, to know, to conceive according to the level of his energy sensitivity. So all things bridge intervals of difference by sympathy. Nothing is ever bridged by antipathy. Psychic sympathy, which is to a sense your true philosophic mercury. Psychic sympathy, therefore, binds the individual to the objects of that sympathy. And by extension, may stimulate or integrate the entire latent sensory band or extrasensory gamut by which the individual, through extraordinary sympathy, may learn to know, apperceive, or sense things normally beyond his comprehension. If, therefore, he would know anything, he must be like it. And this likeness always applies to essence, for no thing can be known by substance. It must be known only by essence. To know a thing, it must be experienced. And to be experienced, there must be a sharing within sympathy itself. All understanding arises not from intellection, but from sympathetic rapport, in which the individual partakes in a common experience with someone else or about something else. The reason why we no longer even attempt to understand things is because we find ourselves locked or isolated in a personal universe in which we are unable to actually participate in the life of any creature except ourselves. We can name potatoes, but we cannot understand them. We can eat them and be nourished by them, but we cannot know them. To know a thing according to its essential nature, we must have an extraordinary sympathy with that thing. Now man may not, at his present stage of evolution, be able to attain a complete rapport with life forms lesser than his own, any more than with forms and beings greater than himself. But by sympathy he may gain a certain awareness, and this awareness is orienting. And this orientation is healthy. And through sympathy, orientation is strengthened, by which the understanding of normalcy and normal relationships is supported and caused to grow. Recognizing also another law in nature, Paracelsus pointed out that the term death as we know it, is an exceedingly abstract term. We regard it as signifying dissolution <laughs> or the total cessation of the animating power within a thing. We consider either that this power has departed or that it has ceased, one or the other. Paracelsus uh, anticipated several philosophers and some scientists in his clear realization that death, as we commonly understand it, simply has no existence. Death, as we recognize it, as separation or cessation, just does not have reality. Death is actually 
one of the common ingredients of life. Death is also a rate of vibration. Now we might say today that it is a lack of vibration. If it was a lack of vibration, we would have a situation rather different from what we have. If death is, was caused by an end of motion, vibration or any other kind of motion, then death would not be unreal. It would be an absolute reality. If anything that ever moved actually ceased to have animation, and this animating power ended in any way, there could be no defense of life against death. Actually, however, death is not an end of motion, nor is it a cessation of motion nor is it a departure of life from substance. Death is a rate of vibration in itself, having its own boundaries, its own nature, and its own substance. Death can be nourished or retarded as any other situation in nature. It can be treated with medicine as an ailment. It can be overcome through transmutation, as the base substances of any material can be changed. To Paracelsus, therefore, death was one of the common commodities of life. We handle or should handle the factor of death as we handle any other chattel, good, or substances. And the proof of his position is rather unique and interesting. He points out that death never results in itself. That nearly everything that dies to our understanding becomes a source of life. The old farmer, when his horse died, buried it under the favorite cherry tree, and the next year he had the best cherries in the neighborhood. Nothing ended. That which causes death to one brings life to another. And from the bodies of the dead, the growth of the living is made possible. Everywhere, death bursts forth into life. In every condition, death, accompanied by its inevitable decay, provides nutrition. Man, is, uh, killing the animal, lives by its flesh or thinks that he does. Playing the vegetable, he lives by its existence. When he drinks water, whether he knows it or not, millions of lives are being sacrificed. Everywhere, death is the nutrition upon which life exists. Therefore, death cannot be death. Death cannot be a termination it cannot be an inevitable end, nor can it be a separation. Because if death was a separation, the horse under the cherry tree would not cause better cherries. Actually, so-called death was a setting up of a chemical procedure and Paracelsus pointed out that in the mystery of metals there could be no stone of the philosopher without death. That unless the metals died, they could not be born again, and in their death they were nourished by their own death. And in their dissolution they were sustained by their own disintegration. Thus disintegration is forever sustaining and releasing life through itself. The next point of importance, therefore, was the relationship between death, disease, and medicine. 
So Paracelsus came to this conclusion. He said, no matter what we do with a thing, there is no such a thing as a useless thing. There perhaps is nothing more useless to man than a gallstone. But because it is useless to man, cannot permit us to say it is useless. It has a use. Because it is a compound, and because energy is locked within it. And somewhere in this universe, there is a need that can only be met by the gallstone that we do not need. Because every integration, every substantial material thing has some kind of a purpose. The anger which makes us sick is somewhere needed. In some part of the universe, anger will fertilize good. There is nothing in the universe that is useless. What we call, therefore, trouble is something where it is not useful, or something necessary and useful that is not immediately available. Paracelsus says that certain diseases which affect the human body are of the greatest of value to other creatures. And that man, suffering from them, does not realize that even as he suffers, some other creature is crying for that ailment to save itself. This opens an immense field of speculation. It reminds us that the air polluted by our breath is of great service to plants that find their life in that which destroys us all through the universe. These sympathies exist. Now Paracelsus tells us that everything that is an entity, that everything that exists, is either where it belongs or somewhere else. If it is where it belongs, it is good. If it is somewhere else, it is not good. But no condition, not even a malignant disease, is mortal. The energy patterns are eternal. And for the individual, in the treating of disease, to overlook this is to work a great hardship on its kind. Uh, that attack of measles that you had is cured by medication, or having passed a certain time, it disappears. What happens? To it? Does it does it cease? No. It becomes a wandering case of measles looking for a victim. Not as a case of measles, but as a vibratory entity. Because every ailment is just as much of an entity as man is, which may lead to the conclusion that in many instances man himself is an ailment. <laughs> and there are some who will agree. Not long ago, in one of our foreign countries, there was a bad outbreak of a certain ailment. The country attempted to solve the problem by deporting the sufferers. 
It was merely trying to pass the ailment on to a contingent of states to solve. Some other country inherited them and began to suffer from the same malady. To drive evil across our borders into some other person's land is not to cure it. And ailments, diseases, are orders of life. They are living things with just as much inevitable and inalienable right to exist as anything else. We may not approve of the house fly, but we know that infinite nature created it. Therefore, it has to serve a purpose, and it does. The fly may be a nuisance, but the total absence of flies would be a disaster, because it would unbalance the processes of nature and would undoubtedly result in plague. Some flies carry it, bring the plague. No flies and the plague would be incurable. This is one of those peculiar patterns that so delighted the Parasulkian mind. Therefore, to cure a disease, says Parasulkian, is not merely to get it out of the body of the sufferer but to redeem it, but to advance its evolution, to raise it out of its present state, because a disease is only detrimental because it is in the wrong place. Merely to dispose of it does not prevent it from attaching itself to another wrong place. Go on. And the master decided to experiment in the redemption, regeneration, and transmutation of disease. Not as affecting merely you while you're sick, but as a principle in itself. Out of this concept, he developed his doctrine of the Bumia, which to him was an elaborate science of bringing shall we say, supply and demand together in an equitable manner. The problem was to find out who needed the disease and make arrangements for that individual to have it and enjoy it. <laughs> now this might sound like a case of spite. Well, it wasn't. Because Paracelsus observed that nearly all diseases being disastrous to man. Man wasn't the thing that needed them. It had to be something else. So he went around. And he discovered that various ailments which we suffer from are vitally necessary as vibratory nutrition to certain other forms of life. And that a particular picture which troubled a human being, caused the pine tree to be happier than ever before. It was balm for the pine tree and misery for man. Now, in order that these sympathies be maintained, Paracelsus devised a concept which he developed to a considerable degree of sympathetic polarities between man and nature, and also means of attracting from the body elements and substances not useful to it, and restoring them to those parts of nature where they were necessary and had been deficient. He brings out something that will probably be infinitely truer today than he could have known in his own time. Namely, that one of man's principal activities is to unbalance nature wherever he can. He is perpetually interfering. In his effort to advance various projects of his own, he exhausts and depletes natural resources in many ways. Although he cannot destroy life, he breaks many of its essential compounds 
and in order to advance some particular interest that he has, permits nature itself to pass into a state of sickness. After man has ravaged the land, the earth is sick. And it is sick not necessarily because this sickness has made man healthy. It is sick because man has wantonly destroyed, has misused and abused, and has been a false gardener in this wonderful world that has been given to him. As a result of this situation, it is necessary and right that man should return to nature in every way that he can, that which is necessary to maintain its equilibrium. That which is needed by man, nature gives him. That which man can no longer use or does not need should be returned wisely to nature and not merely generally expended. As nature is hungry in many ways and parts, so it can accept and use these things. And many plants, flowers, and even animals not only can use, but will absorb, transmute, transform, and regenerate disease elements, which are detrimental to man. Thus the important matter of restoring the balance of nature by a concept of finding utility or the greatest usefulness for all things and placing these things in the most useful possible relationships. In the concept of Lumia, therefore, Paracelsus found that if you took the magnetic field of an ailment, separated it from man, and simply forgot about it, or forced it out of the body by powerful chemicalization, or if you were more skilled in abstract methods, dissipated it by will alone through magic. If you did any of these things, the ailment took the form of a ghost. It became an unembodied or disembodied thing. It remained like some parasite, waiting to attach itself again to somebody which by its emotional or psychic sympathy of a negative kind had come within the magnetic field of that ailment. If the individual, having broken down vital resources, was no longer able to protect protect the magnetic field. These parasites could attach themselves to it. Once attached, unless they were in early dissipated, the psychic nature of the disease took hold of the psychic field and ultimately appeared physical, usually at that time too deeply rooted to be easily corrected. Paracelsus therefore said you cannot consider nature as a trash pile in which you can toss away anything you do not want. This is want and waste to begin with. But if you have a positive knowledge, you can bring this ailment, even while you are working with it, into proximity with a natural catalyzing power and can cause a transplanting of a negative situation. Planting it anew in another instrument where it does no harm but does good. Being suitable to provide additional nourishment and nutrition. Being capable of advancing the death this other form of life. And because it is absorbed into a superior form of life, having its own destiny advanced. If this procedure 
seems a little strange to us, and it would, it has some interesting philosophical overtones. Paracelsus was not one of the physicians who cried out in hatred against disease. To him, disease was not an evil thing, a horrible monster. It was simply an organism unfolding its own way and according to its own nature, but in a place which was not suitable to the health of man. Therefore, it should be placed in an environment suitable to its own growth and nature. And the transference of the intangible or invisible element depended partly on the power of the human will to operate in the magnetic field. This brings us naturally then to the Paracelsian concept of the will as the instrument of divine magic. The Paracelsus has frequently been referred to as a magician, usually in a most depreciatory manner indicating merely a superstitious person uh, who presumed or claimed to possess the power of conjuring. Actually, to Paracelsus, magic was nothing more or less than the product of the direction of the will. Wherever the will can be brought into activity, Invisible changes, lawful and natural, can be induced. If the will requires, wishes, or demands unlawful or unnatural changes, then the individual is a black magician, a fraudster, even a necromancer or a wizard. But if the will is used only to perfect nature and is directed and sustained by wisdom, faith, love, and law. The will becomes the great magical agent. The will becomes the genie of Aladdin's lamp. It becomes the symbol of the wand of the wonder worker. It has sovereignty over all processes in nature unless it disobeys them. The moment it disobeys, it is driven from the garden, clothed with the skins of beasts, and loses its participation in the divine college of the angels. Thus, human will, embodied in the fallen Adam, is in war with divine will, embodied in the archangel Michael, psychopompus of the armies of the Lord. Will must be under discipline, for all wonders in nature are the work of will. Man's will gives him the strange power to be the great physician. In the normal exercise of our daily life, we are continuously calling upon some phase of will. We cannot move without. We cannot act without its motivation. Yet there are many works of nature that can only be accomplished by will. And here is how Paracelsus explains this. We all know that a habit is the result of repetitious action. One incident will not create a habit or an addiction. One dose of morphine taken under medicinal supervision will not make a dope addict. Twenty may. One drink will not make an alcoholic. A hundred may. 
one exercise of the will does not establish a pattern, but a continuous exercise of the will in a particular manner establishes habitual pattern. All of the vortices and foci in the magnetic field can be influenced by the exercise of the human will. This is well known to the Indian yoga uh, philosophy, where the universe, all things, are the product of will and yoga. On the other hand, man's will is not usually so sharp an instrument. It is neither integrated nor purpose, and is usually expended merely in the gratification of diversified whims and passing attitudes and interests. There is only one way, one essential way, in which the magnetic fields of the human body can be directly controlled, and that is through will. Now this places a tremendous responsibility upon the physician. For as Paracelsus says, he must will only like God, or he will damage the situation seriously. On the other hand, it is no more serious uh, to use the will in the healing of a disease than it is to use a powerful chemical medicine which forces certain results regardless of consequences. But as this chemical medicine may have tremendous after effects, so the exercise of will, if it is unreasonable, unwise, selfish, or unenlightened, may correct one ailment only to place another in its place. Thus the cultivation of the will as an agent in medicine means the possibility of man learning first to consciously direct the energies of his own magnetic structure. As he can direct the nerve impulses on the physical surface of things, so that without apparently realizing it, he may move his hand at will. So he can, in the invisible currents of his etheric and magnetic field, also cause these currents to intensify, to move in one direction or another, and to increase and decrease in volume. When imagination is added to will, the rates of vibration can be altered, or the will can move from one level of vibration to another. Imagination, or creative will, can therefore refine uh, the magnetic current, specializing it, detailing it, determining the quality of the energy to be used. Thus, by creative will, backed by knowledge, by a correct knowing of the attitude to be held, the intensity to be regulated, and the proper vibration to be stimulated out of the magnetic Energy can become medicinal, can be aimed directly at a local ailment or a condition, level, stratum, or situation in the body. The physician can direct his own energy to knit a bone, to remove an obstruction, to decrease a toxic situation, to sterilize an infected wound, to stop a toothache or to stimulate a sensory perception that has failed. But it is not merely the result of sending a blind bolt of energy from
pressed onward only with good intentions. There is a complete science of the control of magnetic currents by the educated directing of the will. Paracelsus pointed out, however, that just as there are certain remedies which seem to help almost everything, that there are certain panaceas that are comparatively safe, and when not knowing what else to do, give a small dose of bicarbonate of soda. There are common remedies which have long proved effective, and there are common attitudes which have long proved that they will to a degree prove therapeutic or will cause a flow of energy from the physician to the patient which will be generally helpful. Paracelsus pointed out that a sincere and devout prayer for the recovery of the sick actually accomplishes such a direction of energy. And because the individual has asked nothing for himself and has not attempted to diagnose the ailment, he simply releases out of his sensitivity a highly qualitative constructive energy which may and often does produce results. Now if the person for whom he is praying has a certain ailment, the person praying is very apt to include this in his thinking, if not in his prayer. If he knows, for example, that a dear and beloved friend is going blind, he may pray that this blindness be averted. Aristotle says this is instinctive. It is done by primitive people. It is done by all people. And a degree of result is attained. Not in all cases, not always complete, but there is indication that prayers devoutly bestowed with deep love and veneration and with great humility of spirit to produce results. Therefore, says Paracelsus, if the prayer specifies a certain situation as needing a system, it means that the energy is to a degree influenced by the mental attitude of the person praying. They have, at least to a degree, directed their vital resource toward a particular objective. This, as Paracelsus, is the simple key to the whole situation. Namely, that thought directs will. And that this is perhaps only a general thought. The mother, anxious for an absent child, hopes that the child is safe. The thought, the energy, are now toward safety. It is a conditioned thing. The sick parent receives comfort or consolation from the anxious child. These are instinctive things. Paracelsus points out that these ancient and instinctive processes are founded in a partial knowledge of exact sciences. That whatever we do because of intuitive or instinctive insight is susceptible of complete organization into a scientific procedure. It would not work once or at all, if it could not be standardized. 
It is the absence of knowledge, the absence of the knowing of the procedure, which prevents the systematizing of these primitive and instinctive therapies. So the answer lies, obviously, that in thought there is an instrument which separates energy, focuses their rays, and directs them against areas. The average person cannot so think except instinctively, which means, however, comparatively little exchange of energy because there is no continuity and no depth psychology involved in it. So Paracelsus begins to tell us something of the development of the visualization intensity in the will. If the physician can clearly visualize the structure, the condition, the problem, and energize that visualization. He can then control the flow of energy from himself, create the necessary sympathies with the depleted energies in the suffering and also, if necessary, create antipathetical energies against the condition causing trouble. Gradually, he reduces visualization of will and thus the transmission of energy to an almost exact biological process in which he is using now will instead of biological material. He is using will energy, condition, change, its vibrations raised, lowered, intensified, reduced, through the skillful and complete control of his own energy. He is also then able to transmit this so sufficiently and so completely as to assist the patient. To do this, however, he must not only have a correct diagnosis of the disease, but he must have a correct understanding of the energy fields behind all disease. And he must also, according to the Paracelsian concept, have as, a, as an available factor this knowledge of where the vibration which is causing the ailment can be relocated in a situation in which it is beneficial instead of unbeneficial. The half-foolish physician attempting to perform this may simply attach the ailment to himself instead of the patient, becoming the victim of the, of the diseases in which he specializes, and this is not uncommon. The disease, in order to cease to haunt mankind at all, must be given a useful work to support a kind of life where it is needed. If this is done continuously, the disease itself is reduced, and the probability of its continuance as a plague is also minimized. If then, through this transmission, of energy, under will, certain changes of a beneficial nature are, are accomplished. There is a point that Paracelsus also makes, namely, that the physician is not depleted. He is only depleted under one condition, namely that he forces an artificial flow of energy. In other words, if he becomes in terms of energy, muscle-bound. If he becomes intense, if he becomes pressureful or forceful, attempting to make this energy do things, attempting with his mind to browbeat the etheric and magnetic fields and their centers, 
then he will be exhausted because he will be using energy from a restricted nervous system of his own. He locks himself, then uses energy, and he will be exhausted. If, however, this visualization is completely natural and is accompanied by no tension and no stress, as this energy moves through him to the various ends for which he directs it, further energy moves in immediately into him because he is always in a sea of eternal energy. When he expends, it is replaced unless he locks himself in a psychic situation and blocks replenishment. Fatigue resulting, therefore, from any of these procedures means that the individual is ceasing to be a servant of life and is attempting to be a dictator. All dictatorship ends in exhaustion. The individual forcing ultimately breaks law. Whereas the individual persuading brings the laws to work with him and for him. The great physician, therefore, is the great persuader, hoaxing universal values to express themselves fully and completely, and in no way browbeating them or attempting to force their function. No force is necessary to maintain health. The great need is to achieve relaxed normalcy and by breaking up congestion to enable the structure to develop its own resistance mechanism. Now this is the second part of our subject and it will be completed and concluded next week where we have a good many other factors to consider.